We have reached an inflection point as a continent. We aspire to good governance, great education, functional healthcare, thriving industries built on critical infrastructure, and the full realization of individual potential for all. We know that our future will be shaped by young people who commit each day to thinking differently, to breaking boundaries, and to doing hard things. Where expectations are low, mediocrity thrives. We must not simply set higher expectations. We must redefine our expectations entirely, recognizing that the opportunities and possibilities of Africa are limited only by our imagination and our commitment. At African Leadership Academy, we believe that young people can dream big, take action, and change the world. Our youth are not only our hope for the future, they are our leaders today. They will be Africa's greatest generation. Together, we will redefine expectations. Hello, everyone. Welcome, and thank you for joining us for this webinar on Young African Leaders Championing Climate Change. This is part eight of ALA's Redefine Expectations webinar series, which features themed talks with exceptional young leaders. This series is focused on the notion that Africa's future will be shaped by young people who commit each day to think differently, to break boundaries, and to do hard things. My name is Aaron Appleton, and I'm thrilled to be your host for this webinar. My relation to ALA is through ALU. Uh, I was one of the founding team members at ALU's School of Wildlife Conservation. Well, that is up until about three weeks ago. Um, now I'm currently at Harvard University pursuing a master's degree in the Technology, Innovation, and Education program. And I'm also a part of the Harvard Innovation Labs Venture Program where I'm working on a VR startup called Limehouse, which is the immersive learning marketplace. But I'm very excited to welcome today's panelists. So joining us are three ALA alumni that are working on some very inspiring initiatives in Africa's environmental sector. I would first like to start with a brief introduction to each of them before we kick things off. So our first panelist is Jesse Forrester from ALA's class of 2017. A Kenyan award-winning entrepreneur and visionary, Jesse is the founder and CEO of Mazi, a tech-enabled company in mobility. Mazi is developing electric vehicle solutions, which will be the future of mobility in the global south. Jesse was also the project lead at the Living Machine Project in ALA. Through his leadership, he won $100,000 from the Zayed Sustainability Prize in Abu Dhabi to implement the project. He's also a professional speaker and a host, sharing the stage with ACON and senior leadership from the UNEP, WRI, and WHO. Our second panelist is Wuntia Gomda, also from the class of 2017. He was born and raised in Ghana. Wuntia is incredibly passionate about economics and environmental sustainability. As an ALA student, he also won the prestigious Zayed Sustainability Prize and co-led the implementation of the living machine. Um, so you'll notice that was also with Jesse there. Uh, and you probably noticed them both from the video uh, ahead of time. So the living machine is a sustainable wastewater treatment system that recycles approximately a thousand liters of gray water daily from the school's dining hall and serves as a key component of science education at ALA. 
Muntia has spent the past year bolstering his experience in the field by working on a range of projects, including one funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation at a waste energy company in Ghana. And our third panelist is Lillian Mavoya from the class of 2009. Lillian is a South African who is passionate about environmental conservation and the involvement of young people in combating climate change. Her work centered around developing green technology that is suitable for rural and township dwellers to adapt to the negative impacts of climate change. She was recently recognized by the Mail and Guardian 200 Young South Africans for her outstanding work and also served as an inaugural alumni board of trustee member to the African Leadership Academy. Lillian is currently a DPhil candidate at the University of Oxford, where she investigates sediments from dryland environments to understand the long-term climactic changes in Southern Africa. Welcome Lillian, Muntia, and Jesse. Thank you, Aaron. So before, Thank we get you, Aaron. Started, before we get started with the panelists, I just wanted to give the audience a few pointers. We would love for this to be an interactive session and there is a Q and A button at the bottom of your Zoom interface. So if you have any questions you'd like to ask the panelists throughout the webinar, please feel free to drop them in there. Or if you see someone's question that you like, please click to like the question so that it gets uploaded. Then during the second half of the webinar, we'll spend time asking the panelists some of those questions. Lastly, as an overview for today's webinar, uh, we'll be starting with a special introduction to the background and work each panelist is doing. Then we'll have a short time of guided discussion followed by the last half featuring a Q&A session with you, the audience, and then ending with a closing note from ALA's Galileo. So before the webinar, I requested for each panelist to send me two photos. Uh, when I bring this up in a second, you'll see one photo on the left represents them as a first term student at ALA. And then the photo right next to it on the right represents the environmental work that they're currently involved in. So to set the stage for us, they'll uh, be taking about five minutes each to share a bit about their journey from that picture on the left to the picture on the right, where they are now as young African leaders championing climate change. So let me pull this up for us. All right. Uh, so I'm very excited to start here uh, with Lillian. Um, so we've got her photo up first. So Lillian, will you please uh, kick us off? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, thanks to the organizers for inviting me to this panel. Um, happy Heritage Day to South Africa. <laughs> um, well, yeah, just maybe to share a little about you know my journey from the two photos um by the time i was starting up at ala i had come from um Matamaria high school where um i'd been doing some work related to uh, permaculture gardening and um you know creating climate change awareness campaigns um we also spent some time developing some green technology such as the yolk planting method and all these ideas were really focused on trying to help people in rural areas to respond to climate change on a local level. So um, by the time I was getting to ALA, I knew that I was really passionate about um, environmental conservation and that I wanted to make a mark in the way Africa is responding to, um, you know, the, the, the phenomenon of climate change, which now is really a disaster. We just need to look at the fires in California. So um, while at ALA, I spent some time um, involved in, at the time we had community service projects. So I worked with Grow Green Itzu Singh and um, we were implementing what was called earth boxes. It's another kind of green technology that I can talk more about later if people wanna know about it. Um, and we really were just pioneering sustainable agriculture um, and an informal settlement and trying to work with the people there to co-create um, solutions around how to continue gardening in a sustainable manner despite the threats of climate change. Um, and uh, yeah, I 
finished ALA feeling a lot more confident and really having the courage to follow my passion because <laughs> before going to ALA, I actually was going to do chemical engineering <laughs> because where I came from, that was one of the careers that was sort of encouraged if you were doing well in the sciences, you know, engineering, medicine and stuff like that. Um, but uh, yeah, so I went over to University of Cape Town and studied environmental sciences and geography. Um, following which I then spent some time getting involved in renewable energy. So I started moving from um, doing work on a um, ground level and I started essentially working my way up. So at this point I was working with renewable energy developers in South Africa um, to build, um, at the time I was involved in building two solar farms, each of 10 megawatts and one 27 megawatt um, wind farm in, in the Western Cape. Um, and then, yeah, some of that work, you know, gave me a great platform to um, get to speak at the COP17, the United Nations big climate change conference, some of you might know about it, um, where it really broadened um, my, um, my, 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 my platform for my activism, because I was essentially bringing issues of the people I'd been working with on a local level to a much greater platform that had people who could actually make a change in global policy um, about how the world is responding to climate change. Um, perhaps one highlight on my journey in that time was um, being at the getting a scholarship from the Alan Gray Arbus Foundation. Um, some bursaries and scholarships that were available in South Africa at the time required you to study a particular thing. Um, the Alan Gray Arbus Foundation gave me a scholarship and they said, study whatever you're passionate about as long as it has an entrepreneurial flair to it. And so that got me really excited. And so um, that's where I got to study what I wanted and then ended up starting a social business in vertical gardening while doing that degree. Um, and then, yeah, I guess before I got to University of Oxford, where I am now um, doing a DPhil, I also got the recognition of the Mail and Guardian Young 200, which you mentioned in my bio. They typically receive about 8,000 entries per year, and then they choose the top 200 per sector. So it was really an honor to get that recognition. Um, and yeah, just being at Oxford now doing this DPhil um, is also another sort of affirmation of what I'm doing. Um, and also, you know, it's access to an elite space um, where I'm gaining um, representation because my work is based in Namibia. So I'm still working on Southern Africa's climate. And I get this opportunity to produce knowledge about Southern Africa's climate change information while being at an, in, uh, an institution with such um, access and um, resources. Lovely, thank you, Lillian. All right, over to you, Luntia. Thank you so much. It's really a pleasure to be here and share part of my story with all of you here. Um, so my time at ALA and after ALA, I think ALA um, really exposed me to the environmental sustainability sector a lot because before that I didn't really have much experience in there. And it was during my second year or rather in my first year when um, we were in Johannesburg and we're hearing lots of news about the drought in Cape Town, Cape Town approaching day zero. And we were really thinking about the effect that could have on many other African cities across the continent, especially because Cape Town was much more developed than many other African cities that we have on the continent. And it just really got us in terms of and environmental sustainability. So um, we started brainstorming ideas ideas on wastewater treatment systems that were sustainable and also scalable and also relatively affordable um, to be used in different institutions on the continent. Um, so that's how the living machine came about. Um, that was the need and we applied for the Zyte Sustainability Prize and were fortunate enough to win $100,000 to to implement it and launch it and commission it at ALA. And for me, that was again my first taste of the environmental sustainability sector. I've been very interested in economics and that's what I studied at ALA. 
that's what I'm going to study in university, but this was a nice extension to that and getting to really stretch myself a bit. I really saw the need to use that momentum after ALA. And that's how I got into an internship with Safisana in Ghana, which is a waste to energy company. And what they basically do is collect waste from the surrounding communities and transform it into value added products such as energy and compost. So one fun thing about my work is that I really get to um, see what it's like working with experts in the field, experts in environmental sustainability and learn from them as much as possible and also just try out new things. So, um, so yeah, it's, it's just been really fun. And um, I've just, I'm just really looking forward to extending that learning opportunity and also finding the most impact ahead in the future. Awesome. Thank you, Luntia. All right, now over to Jesse. Thank you so much, Aaron. Uh, it's quite difficult to follow after such two uh, powerful speakers. I just met you, Lillian. Uh, deep respect for the work you're doing. Luntia, we've known each other for a while, so it's great to see you on here. And as you can see, the picture on the left is me and uh, Chim Fekka, for those who know. <laughs> when I was still pretty young and didn't have my beard fully grown out at ALA. And uh, the picture on the right is actually from this year uh, in Abu Dhabi when I was speaking to Akon or speaking with Akon on stage. So for those who don't know, my name is Jesse Forrester. Um, I like to describe myself as an entrepreneur in the food, water, energy nexus. And when I joined ALA, actually, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do, uh, but I knew it was something tech-wise. My mom was actually pushing me to do more computer engineering. And I soon began to realize the interesting bits about business and just how much transformation, transformational potential it has. And so throughout ALA, I began a process of introspection and really just trying to figure out, you know, does this really push my buttons? And um, I've always been passionate about the environment. From a young age, I've always been one of those nerds that puts on a geo and just, you know, kind of watches documentaries for hours on end. I mean, don't get me wrong, I'm still deathly scared of locusts. Like if I had one, I'd probably run away, but I'm so passionate about that. And so, you know, before ALA, I'd done something with Mazi, which at that time was a photography collective. And then when I came to ALA, you know, as Wuncha described with the living machine, we had a really great opportunity when uh, one of the faculty actually brought up the Zaya Sustainability Prize. And uh, I remember doing the application and actually working on this. And my mom was like, hey, you know, you've got college to apply for. <laughs> and I told her, I think this is more important. In retrospect, I think, you know, she had a point because we were chosen amongst a pool of 3,000 3, people, uh, which is quite slim, you know, com compared to college where you have more chances. But I don't doubt it and I don't regret what I did. And after actually LA, I, you know, took what I like to call a gap year, which is turning into like a gap life. Um, and I joined Sanergy, where I also worked in a waste to energy company. And then I realized I wanted to do something. So as I said, I work within the food, water, energy nexus, and I'm super passionate about those three fundamental or foundational industries that I think will push Africa to the next frontier. And I kind of rebranded Mazi and repackaged it. And um, as Aaron said, Mazi is a tech enabled energy company working in mobility. We're ushering in the future of mobility in the global south. It's been really exciting. We're having a fast uh, kind of prototype coming out in October where we're going to be dealing with electric matatus, electric bikes, electric tuk-tuks. And, you know, it's, it's been quite a journey because for me, I think it just leads a little bit beyond that towards a virtual energy grid and interconnected. And I want to make sure that that's super clean. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's definitely great to be here. And I really hope to engage with some of the questions that you have. Thank you. Cool. Thanks, Jesse. I'm very excited for my first electric Matatu ride. <laughs> <laughs> um, so w one thing I noticed as you guys were each sharing is that you seem to have the commonality of applying technology uh, to solve various environmental problems and doing it through the role of entrepreneurship. So I got a couple of questions related to that for, for each of you to answer. And feel free to chime in in, in any order that you like. Um, you, you have an answer you'd like to share. So my first one is, 
Um, please share with me a green technology that you're most excited about and what effect that technology has had on propelling us toward a more climate resilient future. Um, I can start. <laughs> so many to choose from. Um, I'll maybe talk about the rocket stove. So this was, um, um, it's essentially an energy efficient stove, which um, I learned about in 2010 when I was visiting uh, Zambia on a, in a climate change conference. And uh, essentially the rocket stove, as I said, is an energy efficient stove, which is an alternative to open fire cooking. Um, the way you built it is in such that you use locally sourced materials such as sawdust and a lot of um, insulation material. Um, and then you also sort of build a channel where you put in the firewood and then you put in conductors around where the pot will be because most stoves just heat a pot from underneath with a rocket stove you also have metal rods uh, inside this chamber where you put in the pot so that the pot is heated from all sides and that um, it, it is maximum conduction um, to heat it up so you know the rocket stove is one idea that managed to reduce um, firewood usage by more than 50 percent just because of the way in which it was um, maximizing on the energy use and um, implementing a project such as the rocket stove in a lot of rural areas at the time I was working with schools in Limpopo province where a lot of them still used open fire to prepare food for the children uh, that's through the government feeding scheme project and um, if you think about reduction in the need for firewood that means you you're cutting less trees and so that means that you have more trees surviving for longer and therefore contributing to what's taking in the greenhouse gas um, emissions so yeah that was one project that i am um, really excited about awesome yeah i love that uh so jesse and winti i know you guys have uh, worked together and you have experience with several different technologies uh, I believe the wastewater treatment, you also have uh, electric vehicles. I think, Muntia, you're also involved in another energy project. Can you share a bit on uh, those technologies and how you think they may be propelling us toward a more climate resilient future? Um, yes, definitely. I think, um, so where I've been working, um, basically transforming waste into energy, we've been trying to see how we can make that system as efficient as possible and working with many different stakeholders. So one interesting thing we do is we take fecal waste, exactly, and transform that into energy. So we do that in collaboration with truck drivers who go to people's homes to collect their waste and bring it to our site. But one thing we realized was that um, a, lot of these, a lot of this waste goes to be dumped in illegal dump sites, which is really a menace. It, it really harms the environment, especially the oceans. So what we did was we put trackers on these um, fecal trucks and we're just monitoring wherever they went and also taking samples of the waste they brought. So basically we would be able to see where um, these illegal dump sites were. We discovered a few and with the help of the municipality and the government and also with, the, with us testing the samples that they brought in, we were able to um, to first of all determine the quality for production, but most importantly, we could take samples of possibly harmful um, contaminants. So that's useful when you're searching for disease hotspots. So for example, with traces of COVID. And that made me really think of um, the, the fusion of different technologies. So whether it's tracking or sampling, and that really ties into the internet of things, how you fuse different data points and use them to make very informed decisions and really just multiply your impact. So for me, that's been the thing that stood out the most. And I really see it making a change all over the environmental sustainability industry. Awesome. Yeah, thanks for sharing that. Uh, what about yourself, Jesse? Um, <clears throat> yeah, thank you so much. I actually think, you know, those, those two things are really fundamental. And um, for me, I, I'd like to touch on the three different industries. When you look at food, I, you know, there's these statistics that Africa has the most arable land in the continent. 
Um, also, we have the youngest population and set to be that way for the next century. So, you know, there's, there's so much that's really coming up, especially, you know, I had Lillian talking about vertical farming and uh, I was recently on a panel where I was talking about, uh, you know, precision agriculture and using drones to improve the quality of food, uh, using computer vision to check out diseases. And what I think is that, uh, in the, especially in the agri sector, I don't think a particularly very high tech solution or tech is what is actually going to move the needle. I think if we can make lots of marginal improvements in smallholders and, and increase how much that they're able to produce, because that's 70% of actually the food production um, on the continent, we can actually get more food out, right? And then that also ties into what I'm doing with energy, which has kind of like a, a larger link with infrastructure in general. And I'm super excited about the, the possibility of electric vehicles just kind of taking off. And, and beyond that is having a virtual energy grid where you know, we, we can actually repurpose and live bid energy and then just redistribute that when you know, there's some energy down somewhere in say um, Comarok and I'm here in Thick and there's, there's electricity. Uh, so, so definitely there's some IoT play there and there's artificial intelligence in terms of optimizing routes for vehicles, right? So that we can actually get people moving. Nairobi wastes about 50 million shillings in productivity a day, right? So that's insane. And I, I think, you know, even if you're looking at it in terms of emissions, 70% of Nairobians use public transport on a daily basis. And that number is just set to increase. Right now, we are about 4 point something million. By 2035, we'll be 8.9 million. So, you know, with these populations increasing, for me, it's, it's a really important thing to leverage technology for use. And then with water, with what we did with the living machine, I think, you know, it's, it's really foundational when we look at how many people live in poverty and live in places where they don't have access to clean water and sanitation. So I think the living machine technology was really interesting. And what Munche was talking about with the IoT in terms of figuring out a cheaper way to move waste because sewers um, made by municipals are too expensive and high capex. So how can we decentralize and distribute a system that allows people to have dignity so that they can actually you know, go to the bathroom and not have that with open toilets? So th th those are some of the things I'm super excited about in this uh, coming few years, actually. I love that. Uh, very interesting, but yet uh, converging areas of technology you guys have mentioned. I'm wondering, um, yeah, you've mentioned some really cool ones like artificial intelligence, I heard, uh, Internet of Things being applied to transportation networks or agriculture. Um, how, what do you guys see as some of the main barriers for being able to implement those at scale? I think, let me jump in. Um, definitely, there, there is an issue with economics. And I think for me as an entrepreneur, and kind of uh, why I, I actually became one is because I realized that before with, with what I was doing with Mazi, it was photography based and it was great because it was activism, but I really wanted to be at a position where I can bring a product or a concept to market because that actually has the most impact because it changes the way people, you know, engage with certain things. So I think in terms of the tech, finding a good way for it to solve a real problem and actually make sense you know, kind of financially and hit that profit so that you can actually create a sustainable business that helps people for the long term. So for me, I think the real challenge is with how entrepreneurs are thinking about connecting these two uh, kind of technologies and how that actually going to move the needle for the person at the bottom of the pyramid. That's what's going to actually have scale. And Lillian, it looks like you had some thoughts to share as well. Oh, you're on mute. Didn't realize I was muted. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So yeah, some of the, you know, I was um, hearing them talk about the electric vehicles, for example, um, the Matatus. Um, and when I think about implementing technology such as that to South Africa, I think that some of the challenges have to do with the apartheid special planning so, for example, at the moment in South Africa, transport contributes 11% of the total greenhouse gas emissions in the country. And um, 
and some of the problems with the transport, like I said, are intertwined with apartheid spatial planning, whereby you have a lot of um, black, Indian and colored people living on the margins of towns. They spend hours trying to travel into the city center and they end up having a lower quality of life because if you're getting up at 4 a.m. just so you can make it to work on time and then spending hours in traffic to go back home, simply replacing those cars with electric vehicles will not remove the problems that you have with regards to the struggles of you getting to work. So we need to think about a serious transformation in the way we even plan our cities in the context that I'm speaking about in order to alleviate the problems regarding transportation that people have because they're intertwined with the way the economy functions. They're not independent of, um, of, of the economy in which, you know, that that, that the, the country is in. And also, when you think about using electric vehicles, if we were to do that transformation in South Africa, for example, um, the materials that are used to build these cars often still follow an extractivist model. Um, and, you know, that too needs to be thought about. If we really want to make a just transition into um, sustainable development, we need to think of you know, massive transformation um, that looks at different sectors as well. Yeah. yeah. Utia, any thoughts that you wanted to share as well? Or shall we move on to the next question? Um, definitely. I think one of the biggest challenges I've seen so far is um, the lack of collaboration or unifying interests among different stakeholders. So with all of this, I think regardless of which um, sector specifically you're in, there's going to be some interplay between stakeholders. So whether it's government, um, residents, businesses, they all need to come together to, to actually make these solutions work and deliver them in a way that's meaningful. And I think we're still getting to a point where we see that collaboration or where there's that interest in even collaborating. There needs to be a lot of government buy-in. I think it needs to make sense profitably for companies. Uh, consumers need to, to see the benefit or the improvement it will have on their lives. And I think usually there's a lot of, there's a disconnect there. And it's something that's plaguing every, almost every solution that we need to implement. And until we actually get that part done or that part fixed, we'll really struggle to deliver meaningful solutions that uh, deliver impact to everyone. Yeah, thanks. Um, Muntia, you, you mentioned some of these important stakeholders, whether it's a government or nonprofits and in the for-profit sector as well. Uh, I've noticed from some of your experiences that you've all, in one way or another, taken the approach to problem solving of, of entrepreneurship. So I'm wondering if you guys can speak on that a bit and what unique role you think that entrepreneurs like yourselves can fill in tackling climate change. Um, I think with entrepreneurship, it's, 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 it's interesting because I remember in when I was studying business studies, one of the definitions for an entrepreneur is they bring together the, the different factors of production or the different things needed to uh, run a business. And I think it's going to be the same thing in even outside of business. So bringing together all these stakeholders. So that means that entrepreneurs are not just going to be in the private sector, in the government as well, the public sector as well. And just bringing all these um, our own organization or in your public office, I think that's that's how um, us as entrepreneurs are going to to be able to make impact. It's not just entrepreneurs in the private sector; it has to be all over. Mm. And I can add to that by just um, saying, you know, the the entrepreneurship still is um, one of the ways that can actually help to drive us towards a better, more inclusive green economy. So um, just thinking about, you know, when we innovate different green technologies to think about just energy efficiency, um, energy efficiency, e energy inefficiency um, is one of the contributors of greenhouse gases in the country, South Africa. Um, and again, I'll speak more about South Africa because that's the context that I'm familiar with. Um, we have about 25% of the greenhouse gas emissions from the country that come from energy use just to, to power, to heat and operate buildings. Um, and if we were to cut down our greenhouse emissions by 25%, that would take the newer technologies 
becoming more energy efficient, as well as all the technologies getting upgrades to become more energy efficient. So not even inventing something new, but just making the old ones more energy efficient. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I think I, I like to think that entrepreneurship definitely is one of the most powerful tools uh, to socially engineer change. And, you know, I think Africa is going to be most hard hit by climate change, despite the fact that we contribute the least to it. And, um, you know, I, I do agree with what Lillian said. There are lots of technologies out there that really have been efficient, but because of global politics, or et cetera, they haven't really been brought to bear. And now is when we're realizing there's a sense of people actually taking charge. I recently saw there was this clock that was put in Manhattan that just kind of saying, how many years do we have until, you know, we can't reverse the effects of climate change. And so this is why I actually believe, you know, um, SDGs or solving this problem, is a, they say it's a $1 trillion opportunity because not only are you able to, I think, move the general masses, because my experience is for anything to actually really take place, it needs to connect with the people that you're trying to make, you know, kind of think in a certain way. And sometimes you forget that we are part of a very privileged class in terms of what we think about, right? So some people can actually spend and say, oh, you know, I'm going to do this because it's good for the environment. So that's why I'm super centered on what entrepreneurship can bring, but definitely policy needs to be changed and you need to look at value chains and supply chains differently. Uh, but without that buy-in from the majority, you're not really going to get where you need to go. Yeah, I really like that each of you have kind of touched on different aspects to solving this problem. And you've touched on some system level uh, aspects and, and efficiencies. Both Jesse and Montia, you guys touched on uh, some ways technology can help and entrepreneurship can help. I'm wondering if you guys can tell me, what do you think one of the biggest challenges right now to making progress on combating climate change is? Um, I can talk about the ones I've encountered in my work. Um, so one of the challenges is bringing young people to the table. So um, when we used to do sustainable agriculture projects in an informal settlement in Johannesburg, Deep Sloot, um, you know, it was a quite a collaborative project. Um, but we found that even if we tried to engage with the community, we ended up only mainly working with the elderly. The young people did not find the work appealing because, you know, one, it's, 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 it's gardening. The plants will take multiple weeks before they're ready for harvest and they seem to want more instantaneous um, rewards whereas we couldn't get those and then another challenge is just racism you know we had the story with Vanessa Nakate um, earlier this year that was just you know one simple act that represented um, how people in the west often overlook and um, do not recognize uh, Af do not recognize uh, Africans um, who are working in this space. I also see it in my work at the moment where I'm doing research and I you know, often find that there are um, climate scientists from you know, developing, developed countries who go to different countries in the global south, do research at a particular site, and then not even cite one person from that place. You know, why, you know, why, why, why do you not have, why are, are they not citing African scholars? Why are they not recognizing the recognition? I mean, the, the, the contribution of, um, of African scholars, you know? Um, so that th those are just some of the challenges that I see. But another bigger one is that um, the, the, the way our economy is tied to extractive industries, we need fundamental change in order to make, um, a, a difference in how we are addressing the climate crisis that it, the, 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 the compartmentalization of oh climate change problem that will be done by the Department of Environmental Affairs only only have you seen what transport is doing have you seen what the electricity generation is doing you know so um, that that idea of just trying to transform the whole economy in order to have a more just transition that is greener yeah Yes, yeah, I saw yourself on meeting. Uh, what do you think are some of the biggest challenges to making progress on climate change? 
Right. Um, I think I'll, I'll speak on it from the, the finance side. And you, you get to see kind of the same thing. Lots of these technologies that are related to climate change require some time to actually take off. So you need a lot of patient capital to actually push forward what you're doing. And access to capital for Africans is not really easy to get. I mean, there was this study that was recently done about how many you know, Kenyan founders actually get funded. And it's insane that you could actually, it's easier to get funded if you've never lived in Kenya and you want to start a project here versus an entrepreneur who really knows the market. And you see, that's what you end up having these, would I call them feel good projects about what people think we need versus what's actually going to you know, help at the end of the day. Um, so I definitely think that's a challenge in terms of, the, of bringing that to happen. And, you know, just what Lillian said about mindsets of young people, I think, you know, people aren't really seeing the opportunity that's there to actually make a difference and not only make a difference, but make a difference and make a living from what you're doing. Right. I recently gathered some friends and we are, you know, planning on starting a greenhouse and you know, it's super exciting for them to actually realize that this is something that can happen and you can actually make money from this. So I think it's sort of like the mindset shift that's happening because we've been so conditioned to go into being doctors, lawyers, and that's not a bad thing, right? But there's this massive challenges that are ahead of us. And I keep referencing population as a big problem because if we don't prepare right now, I actually really believe that, you know, the 20s, 2020s um, are really crucial for the next couple of decades for the continent, because this is when we're just about to ramp up with population growth. And so if we don't, you know, re-strategize, rethink that on a holistic level, then we are facing such an immense problem and we are actually in the right place and quite positioned to do that. So those are some of the challenges I'm really seeing when it comes down to why climate change is, you know, kind of scary. Very good points. Over to you, Wintia. What do you think? Uh, so I think this, yeah, so I think this really ties into what Lillian and Jesse already said in the sense that um, there really needs to be a mindset shift. I think in terms of young people, I really see that there isn't much urgency in terms of getting into problem solving related to climate change. And um, I think it's also one thing that also comes up is that we also sometimes you don't also really, um, really pay attention to to the need or how urgent this is. And that really sets us back because there's really no urgency in the solutions we try to, to bring up. And we almost make no effort in, in collaborating to bring these solutions uh, to the forefront. And another big thing is, like Jesse said, um, it's re it re we really need lots of patience and patient capital. And I think lots of persistence as well, because lots of these things we're trying to bring forward are new um, they still need lots of testing and it's going to really take a lot of time to, to make them as, um, as impactful as we want and to also make profit out of it from the business side of it. I think that's something Jesse and I really, really noticed with LM Solutions and the Living Machine. We saw that this thing is, it's really a long game. So we have to be really patient with it and realize that the impact is not going to come right now. It's going to come way ahead in the future. So you really have to, you really need that vision, I would say. It's not, it's not a short-term thing at all. Yeah. Yeah. Just to jump in, I also, I really think it's not just about copy pasting solutions. Uh, I just really want to stress the emphasis on that because, you know, the way we operate on the continent is, I would say unique um, to very many places. So, you know, people kind of think that you can just jump in and take a solution there and have, you know, for example, Tesla charging stations all over. <laughs> the, the customer base is completely different. Uh, I think that's important to mention. Yeah, thanks for those insights. Um, we're we're going to transition now over to the question and answer part of today's session. I see there's a number uh, that have already been put in there. Thank you very much for those. Again, if you have some questions that you'd like to ask any of our panelists, please make sure to head over to that Q and A button at the bottom of your screen, enter them there. Or if you just wanna read through them, see which ones you most resonate with, and then click that little like thumb button and it'll help upvote it and make it more likely to be asked. So we have our very first question here. Uh, it's from Kaspa, it's directed to Lillian. 
Uh, Casper says, hi Lillian, how badly affected is Africa with climate change? Can you shed more light to us? Looks like Lillian, her, her screen may be frozen. Uh, so let me go over to another one for Wuntia before we get uh, Lillian back here. So another one from Kaspa. Uh, he says, which environmental contaminants were you checking in fecal waste? And what technology were you using in testing? Okay, so um, with this, I think one benefit um, I had with working this with this company, Safisano, was that we had an in-house uh, quality control team. So that really helped make the quality testing really simple. So we tested for things like um, fecal contaminants, electrical conductivity. You have to check the pH levels and also checked for certain regions of, um, like, for example, cholera. And I think that that was really um, helpful to our operations, and it really helped us map out multiple hotspots of um, of some of these things. So, for example, with the electrical conductivity, we found that that affected um, the growth of plants if the the wastewater we got from our production was used for irrigation. So, we had to check the sources of those high levels of EC, and then make decisions accordingly. Thanks, Wintia. Uh, it looks like we've got Lillian back here. Yes, uh, so hi. I'm, I'm going to go back to that question. Um, the question again was from Kaspa, and he says, uh, Hi, Lillian. How badly affected is Africa with climate change? Can you shed more light on this for us? Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I don't have those statistics at the moment because my computer is shut down. Um, but essentially, um, the the the... the the contributors to climate change, there's an unfair distribution in that, um, whereby most countries that contribute most greenhouse gases, they are not the ones that are hardest hit by climate change. Climate change negatively impacts a lot of people from um, developing countries because of the vulnerability. So think about, for example, how many people just in Africa live in the coastal areas with rising sea levels, those people's habitats will be cleared. Let's talk about the floods just in Mozambique, you know, when something like that happens, because, um, you know, climate change makes more natural disasters to happen with more intensity and more frequency, right? So um, a lot of countries in Africa that do not have resources will find it hard, for example, to move people from one city into a new housing if floods destroy their areas. Think about the Cape Town drought, for example. If that had happened, um, it was the poorest people that were battling to find alternatives to get fresh water, you know? So um, Africa is really one of the hardest hit continents um, by climate change. Mm. Great insights there. Um, Jesse, I'm gonna direct this question at you. I think um, it hits on some of the comments that you had made earlier about copy pasting. So this one comes from Bruno and the question asks, at the height of the pandemic, some great progress was made in terms of improving quality of air and water in Italy and China, just to mention concrete examples. With that being said, should we not take this clear example to build even stronger case to advocate for climate action? And how do we take the conversation from elite spaces to the ordinary people? That's a great question, Bruno. Um, I think Earlier in the year, we actually held a series of conversations with the Zad Sustainability Prize called Hashtag Find the Pioneer. And we were talking about how, you know, with COVID, you're seeing these um, animals coming back to the cities. And it was really interesting to see. And you're definitely right, you know. But then the thing is, is that that wasn't really a structural change. It was just because life kind of paused and people stopped moving as much as they were and industries weren't producing as much as they were because you know it's all set up with a supply and demand based system so there was this sentiment of we need to build back better and uh, actually encouraging people to take the opportunity i saw this with the eu where they started building bike ra lanes so that people can actually move there so i think for us we really need to consider 
exactly how that's going to look like, um, especially, you know, within the continent. And this ties into how do you take the conversation from, oh, this is the World Health Organization, this is UNEP, to the local uh, individual. And I think for where most people are on the continent is that, you know, if you're really struggling, if I could reference Maslow's hierarchy of needs, if you're really struggling to, you know, put food on your table, there's few things that you can actually begin to philosophize about. So I really think that if it actually directly impacts them in a way that improves their bottom line and actually they can see that, wow, because I've done X, because of this technology, we no longer have to use that because of this. And then making it oriented to the point where you're looking at not just profit, um, but for people and tying those two together. That's how I really think we can bring the conversation down towards ordinary people. Oh, Lillian, uh, it looks like you have some tap. <laughs> yes, <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, because I, you know, I've done quite a lot of work um, with, I don't know if by who you're referring to by ordinary people. Oh, no, no, you said people that are not in elite spaces. Yeah, so I have noticed how even with climate change solutions, there is still this um, unequal power dynamic where um, some people still want to import solutions from developing from developed countries and come and plug them in into developing countries. And we have seen in very many um, instances that that does not always work, that it is important to co-create solutions with the people that you are intending to, you, to help uh, to that solution at, you know, uh, back in the day when I used to do a lot of climate change awareness programs, we were working with women in rural areas that were already involved with, uh, with, with, with um, agriculture. So when we try and do the awareness campaigns, we always ensured that they were in line with one, speaking a language that they understand, two, trying to identify the problems with them together. And then when we create a solution, we do it together and then do the testing and failing with them instead of just bringing an already completed solution and saying, hey, here's a thing, try and implement it. So um, yeah, I think it's, it's really important to not just include the, not, the ordinary people in the consumption of the solution, but also in the creation of it. Yeah, I think, I think that's true. And maybe perhaps you misunderstood what I was saying, because I think earlier I was talking about how you can't really copy paste solutions into, into just, you know, take something from the West and bring it here. And if I could reference something, for example, we're doing with Mazi, we know that energy is actually much cheaper. It's actually a quarter the price of uh, fuel and it's more efficient. Uh, and so you can actually save a third of the cost of diesel for ordinary operators every single day. And this is not including savings from solar that we would put in. So I think it's, it's definitely about designing your solution around your end customer, right? And so, so that's why I'm saying it has, definitely has to push the bottom line, whichever way you look at it, whether you know, you're talking to them or not, because that's what I believe will actually bring lasting change. <clears throat> uh, so I've got a great question here for Wuntia. Uh, this one comes from uh, Montselice, and the question is, how has your study at ALA propelled you in the direction you have taken? What projects were you exposed to during your study there that influenced your interest in climate change? Um, yeah, so I think in the beginning I mentioned that um, ALA was really my first, um, the first place I ventured into environmental sustainability. and. I think it was really good the what I think what made it special for me was the community of people I could collaborate with and also learn from. There were so many people who knew a lot more than I did who had many different experiences and just seeing those experiences and hearing from them really um, really helped propel me into into this side then aside that, I think there was also a very practical side to all of this so in Italy, there's um, there's a student enterprise program where students have to um, run businesses or campuses on the campus or even start one. And the, there's there's a lot of um, I would say business management skills we learn from that. And for me, that really helped in the living machine and the planning stages, and also 
LM solutions after the living machine. So I think it really, it really helped guide me towards that. And I really picked up lots of necessary skills to implement in this. All right, um, I've got a question here that has been upvoted 13 times, quite a popular one. Um, so what I think we should do with that one is each one of you should, should uh, come up with a response for this. So it comes from Hatim, and the question is, <laughs> some leaders on the continent argue that responding to the climate emergency will slow African development, adding that it is unfair to the global south to bear the brunt of damage precipitated by emissions from the global north. What is your view on this perspective? Who wants to start with a response? <laughs> um, I can start. Um, I think it's, it's, it reminds me of something Jesse said, um, Afri um, something along the lines of Africa is going to be hardest hit, even though we contribute the least. Um, yeah, it's definitely not fair. I think <laughs> no questions asked, but I think the fact that we're going to be hit and also environmental sustainability is something that has a play in every, almost every facet of our lives. And um, I think working on it in some way does, does something to improve the quality of life. And even, even outside of the argument of whether it's fair or not, I think just the fact that living more sustainably, sustainably improves people's lives, I think that's um, reason enough to, to work in this. And I think it's also going to switch the balance because the effect that's going to have on us should be cushioned a bit if we do take this step. Um, yeah, I can come in. Um, yeah, it's, it's really unfair. <laughs> it makes me angry. <laughs> um, and I think that the, um, the UNF, the UN EP has recognized that, right? They recognize that, um, there is an unfair contribution of greenhouse gas emissions towards worsening climate change. And so they came up with some interesting, um, you know, ideas or tools or funding schemes where they would then have a country in a more developed area trying to fund a climate change adaptation project in a more developing country. So that's one way to, to, to address it. Um, but yeah, I'm still unhappy with it because actually a lot of the projects that they funded, I don't think they are creating massive improvement in the lives of many Africans, whether for better economic returns or for helping them to adapt and be more prepared to address climate change. Um, so I was just looking at the structure of the question in terms of you know, responding to the climate emergency. I don't think that's a question for debate, really. I mean, whether or not we like it, it's, it is here and it is coming. Um, and so for me, how I see this is, we don't, I don't see it really as a problem or actually slowing our development, but I see it as an opportunity to develop differently from the West. I mean, we saw the industrial revolution happen and that was extremely terrible for the environment. I mean, if you think about some of the sentiments back then, you could just consume and consume as much as you wanted and resources were practically considered endless. So what I see is that, you know, African leaders need to, again, rethink the framework in which we're, we're looking at at development and I think yeah sure like it sucks that we are we are facing the brunt of this thing but if we don't come up with a plan or a strategy then we are actually going to be left holding holding the water holding the baby uh, so to speak. Thank you. Um, so we have just a few minutes remaining here before we wrap up. Um, so I wanted to take oh let's say about 30 seconds to a minute from each of you uh, to offer some closing remarks that you'd like to leave us with. Now, how about let's start with Lillian. All right. <laughs> so I'll just take this last minute perhaps to uh, bring attention to um, the work done by um, the Climate Justice Coalition in South Africa um, and 350.org Africa. They have been doing some fascinating work that looks at um, a just transition 
um, and uh, I don't know. Oh, sorry, I, I'm not able to share the the the, the link but, but to the report because my computer has problems. Um, but yes, I just wanted to bring some attention to that and also to the work done by Professor Bagele Chilisa. She's a scholar who's produced work about um, designing research that centralizes indigenous knowledge systems. And she's been an advocate for post-colonial indigenous research and evaluation methodologies for practices that are rooted within Africa. And I'd like people to also look at them because we are all trying to come up with solutions that will be suited for Africa. So um, that's one area I'd say we can look at. All right, over to you, Jesse. Um, I think I'd just like to appeal to the young people or to the people who know young people who are watching this and, you know, just definitely tell them that there is an opportunity here in terms of development. If you want to get involved, you can start at the activism level. You can join a nonprofit. You can start a business. Um, and if you're looking for, you know, access to early capital, try and apply for grants. So I think it's more than just being an observant, you know, kind of texting or posting on Instagram that does have its place, but then actually being an active participant in the fight against climate change. That's what I would say is actually going to move uh, the bar for most of us. Um, I think I'll just like to say that um, environmental sustainability doesn't work in isolation. Um, it's, it has a place in almost every industry, whether it's transportation like Jesse is working in or wastewater treatment. I think that really opens the door for so many of us to enter and really make a change. And it creates so many opportunities to, to deliver impact and solve problems. So I think we just need to remember that there are so many opportunities for us to tap into and make a change. Thank you so much. Um, I really, really enjoyed the conversation we've been able to have here. I've learned a lot from you guys. Um, and definitely we'll be going to check out some of these resources that you've mentioned. Um, just as a shout out to you guys for the awesome work you're doing, I'm sending these hand claps over chat. <laughs> Thank you so much, Aaron. <laughs> and to close this out, we have uh, Galileo from ALA. Thank you, Erin. Hi, everyone. I am Kalalelo from South Africa and from the African Leadership Academy. Um, I just want to take this moment to thank our host, Erin, for facilitating today's discussion so wonderfully and so comfortably. Um, and to our alumni and panelists uh, for sharing your stories, um, for challenging us um, who listen today and who watch this recording to really do our part as you know, I guess inhabitants, right, of this planet, of our home, of resources, um, on which in many ways we rely on for life today and sustaining life for future, future generations. So I love today's topic and I believe it served as a powerful reminder of the urgency of climate change um, on small and large scales for the environment. I wish we had more time. I love um, everyone's passion Lillian is really passionate um, and, and I can see we could have gone on for, for quite some time afterwards. I wish we had more time. Um, speaking on the environment, our next webinar is in a few weeks um, and will be centered around agriculture and business or agribusiness um, with more of our alumni who are doing important and inspiring work in this area. It actually reminds me of a recent alumni from the class of 2018, um, a former student and an advisee of mine, Nesu Mpanju from Zimbabwe, who in his final thesis presentations just a few months ago, um, spoke on his love for agriculture. And while showing a picture of his grandfather and his mother walking in between, I think it was green cabbages and other leafy green vegetables encouraged us to inhale the beauty of agriculture. So I know he'll be keen to join in and I encourage everybody who is joining us today to join in on that conversation in our next webinar. Please look out for our Eventbrite and social media pages for more information on that. This webinar, along with our previous seven episodes um, that have touched on topics such as healthcare, um, I think it was governance, we had creative arts and film, education, finance, engineering, um, and tonight's episode will be available on YouTube um, in the next few days, so please search for African Leadership Academy, the page. 
But otherwise, that's all for myself and the ALA team. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, thank you to our panelists once again and for everybody for joining. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Stay safe. All right. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. You.